Hi everyone. So in this video, uh, I'm going to go over some of the, um, uh, the problems here uh, that you may find on the chapter uh, 5 and 6 exam. So this is basically a, a problem set, as best I can guess, of uh, relevant topics. I haven't seen the exam. Um, but I will tell you that a few of these questions um, are probably a little more challenging than what you're likely to find um, on a test. And when I come to one of those, I will um, mention that. That being said, if you can do them, uh, that's good. And, you know, it's good practice, uh, but they may be a little bit more uh, difficult. And there's not many, uh, but there are a couple. Last thing that I just basically wanted to say before I do this is that if you look at the link uh, at the descriptions down below, sorry, you will find links for both a copy of this blank exam, a copy of the exam with the answers written in, um, in case you just want to look at it, and you will finally find uh, a list of the times and the time that I go over each question. So this is designed to help you uh, so you can just uh, find the questions that you want to watch and you don't need to watch the whole thing. All right, so without uh, going into anything else, let's get started. Question one says, which of the following processes is exothermic? So we need to remember the two terms, exothermic, and endothermic. So these are two terms for chemical reactions and they refer to enthalpy or heat energy of the reaction. So exothermic means that heat energy is released. And another way of saying released is taken away. And if you're actually looking at delta H values for exothermic, delta H is negative. In this process, uh, question, there are no delta H values given, so that doesn't come up. But in exothermic case, delta H is negative. Endothermic means heat energy is added. So if you want to think about this from a practical way, an exothermic um, chemical process is one that gives off energy and feels hot when it occurs. An endothermic process would feel cold. Heat energy has to be added, or this is the kind of thing that if you were actually trying to get it to occur more quickly, you might want to heat it up. So this is basically... Um, several different ways of thinking about the same thing, and you have to think about them different ways in different cases. So in this case, the reaction in a cold pack often used to treat injuries. Well, inside of the cold pack, it's getting cold, which means it's taking heat away from the surroundings. If you put this on your ankle, your ankle is the surroundings, and it's sucking heat out of your ankle. That's why it's cold. So this is an endothermic process because heat energy is added from the surroundings, in my example, the person's ankle. Water freezing. This is going from water as a liquid to water as a solid. If you want water that's a liquid to turn into a solid, you have to take heat energy away. In fact, you'd put that water in the freezer, for example. The freezer is a colder surroundings, therefore heat energy comes out of the water and it freezes. So water freezing is an exothermic process because heat energy has to be released from the water or heat has to be taken away from the water in order to get it to freeze. Water melting is exactly the opposite. You have a solid going to a liquid. When water melts, the solid becomes a liquid. If you want a solid to become a liquid, you need to add heat energy. So if you take an ice cube and you put it on the countertop, the countertop is warm enough, uh, the room is warm enough, that the heat energy from the room will go into the water and then it will cause it to melt. And the vaporization of water. So this is turning water from a liquid to water as a gas. So if you want to turn something from a liquid to a gas, you have to put um, heat into it. Uh, so heat energy has to be added. So this is again an endothermic process. So in all cases, A, C, and D, in order to make these uh, changes, or in the case of a cold pack, uh, how the cold pack works is, you have to put heat energy in, in all of these cases, in order to get water to melt or water to vaporize, go from a liquid to a gas. In the case of a cold pack, again, the person's ankle is um, providing heat energy to the cold pack. That's why it feels cold. So those are all endothermic. The only one that's exothermic is water freezing, because again, you have water going from a liquid 
to a solid and you have to take energy away. So energy needs to be released from the liquid water in order for it to turn to a solid. That's an exothermic process. Number two says, which of the following represent uh, the signs, uh, which of the following signs on Q and W represent a system that is doing work on the surroundings as well as losing heat to the surroundings? Now, if you download a copy of the um, answers, you can find this little guide right here, and I'm just going to put it up so I don't have to um, basically rewrite it. So it says Q is heat, W is work. When Q is negative, heat is released. This would feel hot. This is very similar to exothermic. When Q is positive, heat is added. It feels cold, which again is similar to endothermic because delta H is Q, heat energy. So these are the cases for Q. So again, Q is negative when heat is released, it would feel hot. Q is positive when heat is added and it would feel cold. Work is negative if the system does work. This is where it expands in volume. The volume gets greater. Work is positive when work is done on the system or the system gains work, and this is where it contracts. So this is a helpful little guide to remember whether Q and W are positive or negative. So I would suggest that you uh, memorize that. So here, what we have is, which of the following signs on Q and W represent a system that is doing work on the surroundings? Well, if the system is doing work, the system is losing work. The surroundings are gaining that work energy. So with respect to the system, W here is negative, as well as losing heat to the surroundings. So this, this um, system is giving off heat. This system would feel hot if you were standing next to it. So here, Q is negative because the system loses the heat energy. So the choice where W is negative and Q is negative is choice letter D. Number three says, define heat capacity. Remember that there are three types of heat capacity. There's heat capacity, specific heat capacity, and molar heat capacity. So the specific heat capacity is the amount of um, energy required to raise one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. The molar heat capacity is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one mole of a substance by one degree Celsius. The heat capacity is the quantity of heat required to change a system's temperature by one degree Celsius. You'll note that heat capacity doesn't have an amount term. So this has the amount in grams, this has the amount in moles. Heat capacity is for the whole system's temperature change by one degree Celsius. You may ask yourself, well, why do these two different types of systems exist? Well, specific heat capacity and molar heat capacity are useful if you want to do different amounts of it. So if you add um, energy to a bathtub full of water or you add energy to a cup of water, the heat, if you add the same amount of energy, the heat change or the temperature change is going to be very different um, based on whether you have a bathtub full of water or a cup of water. So specific heat and molar heat capacity are useful for this because they take into account the amount. However, if you have a device like a bomb calorimeter that's made of many different substances, all of which have different heat capacities, it can be easier to just use heat capacity where it's the quantity of heat required to change the system's temperature by one degree Celsius. There's no amount term, so it's for, it's for a fixed system. The most common example that I know of is the bomb calorimeter. So that's the difference between these th uh, three different types of heat capacity, and it's important that you're aware that they're not all the same thing. All right, number four says, which of the following substances with specific heat capacity provided would show the greatest temperature change upon absorbing 100 joules of heat? Well, if you'll remember, Q equals the mass times the specific heat capacity times the change in temperature. So if we add a certain amount of heat, the change in temperature is going to be greatest. So Q is a fixed number. Delta T is going to be the highest when C sub S is the lowest because we're adding the 10 grams in all cases. So mass is constant. C sub S is different. So as C, C sub S goes down, delta T goes up in order for Q to remain constant. So in this case, the one with the lowest uh, specific heat capacity 
is lead. So lead's temperature will change more when you add 100 joules of heat than water's temperature. Water's temperature will barely change at all, and the lead will get um, somewhat hotter. One common example of this, it's not a perfect example um, because masses may not be the same. However, if you go to the beach on a hot, uh, sunny day, the sand and the water are essentially being exposed to the same amount of heat. That heat is coming from the sun. And when you step on the sand, it burns your feet, but the water feels relatively cool. Why? Because sand has a much lower specific heat capacity than does water. So therefore, the temperature change of the sand is far greater than the temperature change of the water. So this is just a question getting at that concept. Question set, uh, five says, calculate the change in internal energy delta E for a system that is giving off 65 kilojoules of heat and performing 855 joules of work on the surroundings. So this is one of the easiest equations you're ever going to learn. Delta E equals Q plus W. But there's two problems with this. One problem is you have to find the sign on Q and W. Is it positive or is it negative? And you have to get that from the context of the question. The second problem is this one's in kilojoules and this one's in joules. Since all the answers are in kilojoules, I'm going to convert this to kilojoules. It's not technically wrong to convert this to joules and then convert your answer to kilojoules, but that's going to be an extra step. So I'm just going to convert this to kilojoules. So let's look at this. The system is giving off 65 kilojoules of heat. So if it's giving off 65 kilojoules of heat, Q is negative, I'll put delta E here again, and Q is negative 65 kilojoules because it's losing that heat energy, the system is, and is performing, it's doing 855 joules of work. So the system is doing work. So the work is also negative, but I don't want to put it in a joules again. I want to divide that by 1,000, negative 0 0.855 kilojoules. It's negative because it's performing the work. It's doing the work. And it's in kilojoules, so I have to divide by 1,000. So I'm going to do plus negative 0 0.855 kilojoules, which is, of course, just minus 0 0.855 kilojoules. When I do that, and I round to one decimal place, I find that delta E equals negative 65.9 kilojoules. One thing that's very important to point out is that other answers where you make, um, in this case, you made Q pos uh, negative and W uh, positive, and in this case, you made uh, Q positive and W negative, they're all here. So you need to figure out what the sign is. Don't rely on a multiple choice test with only the answer that works being there because the other possible answers are there. So it's really important um, to practice with a couple of these problems so that you know the signs on Q and W because that's the whole trick of this problem. Oops. All right, so number six says, Choose the thermochemical equation that represents the enthalpy of formation for lithium sulfate. And it gives you the standard state of sulfur, which is S8 solid rhombic. Um, if you wanted to look that up on a table, you'd look for the thing with the delta HF naught of zero. So this is something we need to remember, okay? The thermochemical equation is formation of one mole of a compound from its elements. And you may recall that elements have an enthalpy of formation of zero. So it's the formation of one mole of the whatever the compound is, in this case lithium sulfate, from its elements. So there's two things you need to remember here. First thing, you're going to form one mole. Second thing, you're going to form it from the elements. So let's look at this. Okay, we're going to form Li2SO4 solid. So, what do we need to form that? Well, we need lithium, which is a solid. We need sulfur, which it tells us is S8, which is solid rhombic. And we need oxygen, which is a diatomic gas. And I should have left myself some space for coefficients. 
Now, I must form one mole of lithium sulfate. I can't form more, I can't form less. And if you remember um, delta H reaction and the products minus the reactants, you have to uh, multiply by the number of moles. That's because all of those enthalpy of formation values you look up are for the formation of one mole. It makes life easier. However, it does allow us to do something weird in the balancing. So for lithium, it's straightforward, right? Lithium, two lithiums, we put a two here. For sulfur, it's not straightforward. In the past, we would have had to make at least eight lithium sulfates. But in this case, we can actually put a one, I'm going to put that plus over here, a one eighth there because we only need one sulfur. So we need one eighth of an S8 to get our one sulfur. Oxygen, again, is more straightforward because we have O2 and O4, so we can just put a two there. So we have to form one mole. We have to form it from its elements. This is the reaction, and this matches up with choice letter C couple things to remember. If you see more than one mole over here, okay, it can't possibly be the answer. If lithium sulfate is not the product, it can't possibly be the answer. So there, this one, this one, and this one are that case. Last thing is, if you see ions, it can't possibly be the, the answer because ions are not elements. So it's the formation of one mole from its elements. If you remember these two things, this is a relatively easy question. So I said at the beginning, there are a few questions that were um, probably a little harder than you, what you might actually find on the test. And this is an example of this. Uh, the first part is pretty straightforward. The second part is not. So if you may not find a question that has both of these parts. However, if you could do this, uh, that's good. So it says a 35.6 gram sample of ethanol is burned in a bomb calorimeter according to the following reaction. If the temperature rose from 35 degrees C to 76.0 degrees C, and the heat capacity of the calorimeter is 23.3 kilojoules per degree C, what is the value of the enthalpy of the reaction? And it gives us the molar, math of, molar mass of ethanol um, in order to uh, figure that out. So what we want to do here is we want to find the um, amount of heat that's given off when we burn 35.6 grams of ethanol. And to do that, we use that um, essentially Q equals C of the calorimeter or the heat capacity times delta T. Well, in this case, this is equal to um, 23.3 kilojoules per degree C times 41 degrees C. That's the temperature change from 35 to 76. 76 minus 35 gives you 41 degrees C. And we find that when we do this math, that it's 955.3 kilojoules of heat energy that's released. But this isn't delta H of the reaction, because this is per 35.6 grams of ethanol that I'm going to abbreviate ETOH. So this isn't delta H reaction. So to find delta H of reaction, we have to realize that in this reaction, we burn one mole of ethanol. If we burn more than one mole of ethanol, this would require an additional step. But in this case, to find delta H of the reaction, it's equal to 955.3 kilojoules per 35.6 grams times. We want to convert this grams of ethanol on the bottom to moles of ethanol. So in this case, what we put is the 46.07 moles, or excuse me, grams of ethanol, which is the molar mass of ethanol, which is given in the problem over one mole of ethanol. And when we do all that math, <clears throat> we get 1.24 times 10 to the 3 kilojoules per mole. The final thing we need to realize is that this is actually a negative number. Why is it negative? Because the heat of the, ca uh, the temperature of the bomb calorimeter went up. So when we burned the ethanol, the energy was released. So 
that makes sense, right? You burn some organic compound, the heat's going to be given off. Ethanol is no exception. But we have to remember that this is negative because we burned the um, ethanol and the calorimeter warmed up. On the answer key, I put it negative over here as well, and because heat energy is released. In this case, I waited till over here. But either in either case, it does have to be negative. Note that if we were doing this for oxygen, we would have to then um, change for the appropriate number of moles of oxygen, because there are three moles of oxygen that are reacted, instead of just one. But in this case, since there is just one, we can do it this way. So finally, this is a little bit harder. I would say this part where you find Q um, is more standard, and then this is the more advanced part here. Um, but if you can solve this problem, you're doing well. Question 8 says, the specific heat capacity of solid copper metal is 0.385 joules per gram K. How many joules of heat are needed to raise the temperature of a 1.55 kilogram block of copper from 33 degrees C to 77.5 degrees C? So to do this, we need to know that Q equals the mass times the specific heat capacity times the change in temperature. This is the mass in grams. This is specific heat in joules per gram degree C or joules, joules per gram K. Remember, since it's a change in temperature, a one degree Celsius change and a one degree Kelvin change are the same because uh, each degree is the same magnitude. So you don't want to change the um, temperatures. And this is delta T in degree C or K, you can use either. So this is basically what we've got. So in this case, we want to solve for Q. So Q equals the mass, but the mass is given in kilograms. We need the mass in grams. So we need to ma multiply that mass in kilograms by 1,000. 155.0 grams times the specific heat capacity, which is given 0 0.385 joules per gram degree C. Uh, or K, it doesn't matter, but the temperatures are in C, so I'm going to leave that as degree C, or I could change the temperature to K, it doesn't matter. So here I take 77.5 minus 33, and I find that the change in temperature is 44.5 degree C, or 44.5 K. Um, I do want to spend one second talking about that, uh, the temperature change, just so it's more clear. If I have something at 273K, that is the same as zero degrees C. If I heat this up by 10 degrees, it goes up to 283K. If I heat this up by 10 degrees, it goes up to 10 degrees C. This are the same. These two temperatures are the same, just in different units. These two temperatures are the same, just in, in different units. Here, delta T equals 10 K. Here, delta T equals 10 degrees C. So the temperature changes are the same, even though the units are very different, right? The actual temperatures are very different. 273 to 283 versus 0 to 10, those are very different. But delta T is the same. That's why I can simply just um, change these units, K and degree C, for this particular equation. If you're doing gas law stuff, you can't do that. Anyway, when you do all this math, you get Q equals 2.66 times 10 to the 4 joules, which is choice letter B on the answers. Question 9 says, use the information uh, provided to determine the enthalpy of the reaction for the following reaction. So to do this, we're given um, the enthalpies of formation of these different um, compounds, with the exception of chlorine, which is an element, so its enthalpy of formation is zero. So what the equation we need to use is delta H naught of the reaction equals the summation of N, the number of moles, times delta H naught of formation of the products minus the summation of N times delta H F naught of the reactants. So enthalpy is a state function, which means it's independent of the path. 
so similar to altitude. If you could climb up a mountain or you take a helicopter up a mountain, your change in altitude are the same. Even though it would take a lot more effort to climb the mountain than to take a helicopter, your altitude change is the same. Enthalpy is also a state function. So it's independent of how you get there. The amount is the same. So what we essentially do is we say we take these um, compounds, if they're compounds, uh, in this case you have an element, and we destroy them back into their elements. So in this case we would take methane and turn it back into its elements. We then recombine those elements to form these products. Remember that enthalpies of formation are the amount of um, enthalpy for forming the compound from its elements and forming one mole. So what this means is we take the enthalpies of the formations of the products and we add them to the negative of the enthalpies of formation of the reactants. Why? Because we're destroying the reactants. We're not forming the reactants. We're taking the reactants and turning them back into their elements. This works because enthalpy is a state function. As far as actually doing it, it's fairly straightforward. Delta H naught of the reaction equals the first one, which is um, CHCl3, which is chloroform, and it's minus 30, 134 kilojoules. So we do minus 134 kilojoules plus the next product is HCl, and there are three of them. So we have to multiply by three because the enthalpy of formation is for one mole. This is for one mole. We have to multiply that by three. So three times minus 92 kilojoules. Then we need to take all of that. I guess I already made the second parenthesis. Oh, no, I didn't. So I want to have that parenthesis minus the product CH, or excuse me, the reactant CH4, which is minus 75 kilojoules. And Cl2 is not listed, but Cl2 is an element, so its enthalpy of formation is zero. So you could put plus three times zero, or you could just leave it at that. When you do all of this math, you find that delta H naught of the reaction is equal to minus 335 kilojoules. So this is um, how you can use enthalpies of formation to determine the enthalpy of the reaction. Question 10 is a Hess's law problem. So we're given a reaction, 4SO3 gas yields 4S solid plus 6O2 gas, and we want to know the enthalpy of the reaction. We're given a reaction, SO2 yields S plus O2, and 2SO2 yields uh, plus O2 yields SO3. So what I want to do is I want to label this as reaction one and this as reaction two. And what I want to do is I want to get these two reactions to add up to this reaction. Well, when we add reactions together, it's actually quite simple. All you have to do is write everything on the reacted side on one reacted side and everything on the product side on one product side. So, but the trick is here that we need to get these two reactions to add up to the reaction that we want. Now you're at a big advantage here. These are pre determined problems that will work. So you can take, you can use strategies that may not work if you were trying to do this from an infinite list of reactions that are known. But in this case, you could pick, um, you can kind of do these a little bit differently. So what I look at, first of all, is I look for things that are only in one reaction or the other. So if I look at this reaction here, I don't see any SO3, I do see S. So let's see if there's S in the other one. There is no S in the other one. So I want to focus on S now. Let's look about oxygen. There's oxygen in this one, and there's oxygen in this one, so I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to focus on S in reaction one because the, it's the only in reaction one, and it's not in reaction two. Now, again, the strategy would not work if you were using this, you know, for, for some research purpose or something like that, but this strategy does work for solving these problems uh, that are pre prescribed and will work out. So what do I notice? There's two things I want to look at. One, I want to look at the stoichiometric coefficients. And two, I want to look at whether the thing is on the products or the reactants. So if I look at, um, if I look at this, it's on the right side. So I have S on the, react on the product side in both cases. So I don't need to fix that. But I don't have four of them. I only have one. So I don't have the right stoichiometric coefficient. So how do I do that? Well, how do I fix that? I take reaction one and I multiply by four. So instead of one of everything, I'm going to have four of everything. So four SO2 gas yields 
sorry, 4s solid plus 4o2 gas. Now, if I do this reaction four times, remember that the enthalpy of the reaction is for the reaction as written. So if I do it four times, I have four times the enthalpy. So I take this number and I multiply by four. So delta H of this new reaction is not 296.8. It's four times that, which is 1187.2 kilojoules. Why? I multiplied everything by four. I also have to multiply delta H by four. For reaction two. For reaction two, I need to, again, take a look at what's going on. So look for something that's unique, all right? It doesn't have sulfur, so I don't have to worry about that. We already determined that oxygen is in both, so that's not what I want to look for. SO3. SO3 is only in this one. It is not in reaction one. So SO3 is what I want to focus on. Again, I'm checking two things. I'm checking to see if it's on the right side and if it has the right set, uh, stoichiometric coefficient. So it's on the wrong side this time, right? It's a product, and I want it to be a reactant. So I need to reverse this reaction. If I reverse this reaction, I reverse um, delta H. That means I make it from negative to positive. But it's also the wrong stoichiometric coefficient. So I have two problems. I don't have enough. So I also need four, so I also need to double. So in the case of reaction two, I need to reverse and double. So I want to reverse and double this reaction. So four SO3 gas yields four SO2 gas plus two O2 gas. So I reversed and doubled this. Now, I also have to reverse and double this. Again, reverse just makes, makes it make it positive, and double means just multiply by two. So delta H naught of the reaction, make it positive and multiply by two, I get 395.6, 395.6, not 96, kilojoules. All right, so now I've got my two reactions. The only thing I need to do now is add the two reactions together and make sure they add up to the overall reaction. Well, I'm going to write it here because I don't have a lot of space. So to add reactions together is actually more, pretty straightforward. Just write everything on the reactant side on one reactant side and everything on the product side on one product side. So I take 4SO2 gas, the first reactant, plus 4 so did I make a mistake? Yeah. 4 SO2. Gas. Yields. 4. S. Solid. Plus 4 O2 gas plus 4 SO2 gas plus 2 O2 gas. So I literally just wrote all of the products on one product side and all the reactants on one reactant side. Now I need to cross out like terms. So there's 4 SO2 here and 4 SO2 here. There is um, 4O2 here and 2O2 here, which gives a total of 6O2. Because I have added the reactions, I can also add the enthalpies. But before I do that, let's see if this works. So rewrite 4SO2 gas yields 4S solid plus 6O2 gas. And what you'll see is I magically got this original equation. Now it wouldn't work this way if I didn't pick the right two equations here, but they do pick the right two equations here for you on these types of questions. Since I added the reactions, I can add the enthalpies. Said another way, I take this plus this and I get the total by simply adding them together, which is 300 and uh, no, it's 1582.8 kilojoules 
which is rounded to 1583 kilojoules choice letter E. So this is Hess's law. This is a complicated problem, and it's something that I strongly recommend you practice. Just one more quick thing. I noticed that I, when I wrote this, I didn't write SO3. I wrote SO2. I canceled out SO2 here, but for some reason, I accidentally uh, didn't write the 3 um, when I was um, copying this in. So I guess technically I probably should have written the other one, but at the end of the day, there's four SO2 on both sides, and the SO3 comes down. So sorry for that confusion, and uh, hopefully I made that clear. Question 11 says, use the following thermochemical equation. Um, determine the amount of heat produced from the combustion of 24.3 grams of benzene, and it gives us the molar mass of benzene. So what's important to remember for thermochemical equations where you're given the enthalpy of the reaction is, for it's, uh, is that this is the enthalpy for the reaction as written. So if I burn 2 moles of benzene with 15 moles of oxygen, this is how much heat energy will be given off. So this is very important because now I can use this in dimensional analysis. Said another way, as a plan of attack, I can convert from grams of C6H6 to moles of C6H6 and then finally to kilojoules. So starting with grams, I have 24.3 grams of C6H6 times. In this case, I want to put one mole of, um, excuse me, not one mole, what am I doing? I want to put one mole of C6H6 on the top and its molar mass, 78.11 grams of C6H6 on the bottom because I want grams to cancel out. That's why labeling everything is helpful because I noticed instantly that that wasn't going to cancel out and I fixed my mistake. Next, I want to convert to kilojoules. Well, what this means is that there are 6,278 kilojoules for every two moles of benzene. I want moles of benzene on the bottom, so I put two moles of C6H6 on the bottom, and on top, I put the 6,278 kilojoules. And when I do that math, I get 977 kilojoules. Multiply by the top, divide by the bottom, multiply by the top, divide by the bottom. So this is how much heat energy is released. Note, you may ask, why isn't it negative? Because it says, determine the amount of heat produced. It wants the magnitude. It already says the heat is produced. You'll also notice that none of the answers are negative. That's why it's not negative. Negative in thermodynamics doesn't really mean negative. It means released positive means absorbed. That's what negative and positive mean. The magnitude of the heat is the same. So in this case, 977 kilojoules. Number 12 says, which of the following occur as the energy of a photon increases? Okay, so um, in order to solve this problem, we actually need to know um, a couple of equations because it asks us about uh, speed, frequency, wavelength, and of course, energy is what we're given because energy increases. So what we need to look at are two equations, E equals HC over lambda, and E equals H nu, because um, C equals lambda nu. So these are just combining two equations together. So E is the energy of a single photon in joules. H is Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. C is the speed of light in a vacuum, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And lambda is the wavelength in meters. E is still energy in joules. H is still Planck's constant. In this case, this is nu, which is the frequency, which is in hertz or per second. So how often something happens in a second or cycles per second or whatever, which is called hertz or reciprocal seconds or per second. So these are basically the equations that we need to know. On the actual answers that you can download, I have this stuff written out um, so you can see uh, what these are um, instead of me just saying them in words. So a couple things to look at. It says, which of the following occur as the energy of a photon increases? The speed increases. That is incorrect. C is the speed of light. The speed of light is a constant. It doesn't change. So it doesn't matter. It's not dependent on energy. It's a constant. 
the frequency decreases. So let's look at this. If the energy goes up and E equals H nu, what happens to the frequency when the inner energy goes up? The frequency must also go up. Why? Because it's on the top. So if the energy increases, the frequency must also increase because H is a constant. So as one increases, the other increases. Said another way, they're directly proportional. So this isn't correct because as energy increases, so does frequency. The wavelength increases. Let's look at this one. Here's where wavelength is. As energy increases, wavelength's on the bottom. So in order for H and C are constants, in order for energy to go up, lambda actually has to go down because it's on the bottom. So if it's on the bottom of the equation, in order for energy to increase, wavelength must decrease. So this isn't correct. The wavelength gets shorter, which is the same thing as saying decreases, is the correct answer for the uh, reason that we just explained. Number 13 says, calculate the wavelength in nanometers of blue light admitted by a mercury vapor lamp with a frequency of 6.88 times 10 to the 14 hertz. So C equals lambda nu. So in this case, um, C, the speed of light, equals the wavelength times the frequency. In this case, we want to solve for the, free, the wavelength. So lambda equals C over nu. So we divide both sides by nu, divide by nu, and this cancels, and we get lambda equals C over nu. Well, the C is the speed of light in a vacuum. I'm just going to write it as 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. There are other values of this, um, 2.998 or something, um, which just have different numbers of sig figs. But we'll get close enough if we just use 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And I'm going to divide this by the frequency given, 6.88 times 10 to the 14 hertz, which is per second. And when you do that math, you get 400, or excuse me, 4.36 times 10 to the minus 7. That's in meters. This gives you the wavelength in meters, not in nanometers. However, visible light, including blue light, are hundreds of nanometers. So hundreds of nanometers are going to be um, the answers. All right, this is 400 and this is 200, but the hundreds of nanometers are the answers. This is actually UV light. Look, if you want to just pick 436, that is the right answer. Okay, so if you don't want to bother with the next step, you'll be okay, because it's going to be 436. The digits can't change. Only the thing that's going to change is the order of magnitude. If you want to do the math, it's 1 billion nanometers. 1 times 10 to the 9 nanometers is equal to 1 meter. And then you get 436 nanometers. But notice that this number can't change, right? Because we're multiplying by just orders of magnitude. So one, we're not multiplying by anything else. So therefore, um, all that changes is it goes to 436 or 4.36 times 10 to the 2 instead of 4.36 times 10 to the minus 7. So that is how we could find um, the wavelength of this blue light. Number 14 says, calculate the energy of the violet light emitted by a hydrogen atom with a wavelength of 410.1 nanometers. So in order to do this, we need to use an equation that I showed before in a previous question, E equals HC over lambda. So in this case, when we're doing this um, uh, equation, we need to remember, first of all, that H and C are constants. So H is Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. C is the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And lambda has to be in meters. Why? Because C is in meters. So you have to convert it to meters. Said another way, you have to divide this by 1 times 10 to the uh, 9. In the previous question, we multiplied by 1 times 10 to the 9. So we're plugging in 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds times 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second divided by when you divide this by 1 times 10 to the 9 what you find is you get 4.101 times 10 to the minus 7 meters 
and hundreds of nanometers are very common because it's visible light. So if you remember that hundreds of nanometers are times 10 to the minus 7 meters, it's kind of a trick um, for moving this. When you do this, you find that E equals 4.85 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. The thing that I always like to point out about this is, think about how small of an amount of energy this is. 10 to the minus 19 joules. This is, within reason, an immeasurably small amount of energy. So, if we have such a tiny amount of energy, how is it possible that, within reason, the vast majority of the energy of the Earth comes from the Sun? Vast, vast, vast majority. So, how is that possible? Well, the answer is, lots of photons. Individual photons don't have very much energy. But lots of photons have lots of energy. Anyway, to solve this problem, um, we get choice letter D. It's important, again, to remember, you have to plug in your answer in meters. You cannot plug it in in nanometers, or you won't get the right answer. You certainly won't get the right order of magnitude. Number 15 says, calculate the frequency of red light emitted by a neon, neon sign with a wavelength of 659.9 nanometers. So this is very similar to question 13, just a different variable. So C equals lambda nu, just like before, except this time we want to solve for nu. Nu equals C over lambda. In all of these cases, the speed of light is in meters per second. So we need to plug in the... Um, wavelength in meters. So it's 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second for the speed of light. And then we need to convert this to uh, meters by dividing by a billion, 1 times 10 to the 9, which is 6.599 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, because 1 meter, uh, one nano, uh, one meter equals 1 times 10 to the 9 nanometers. So we need to divide this by 1 times 10 to the 9. When you do all that work, you get 4.55 times 10 to the 14 seconds to the minus 1. A second to the minus 1, or per second, or reciprocal seconds, is equal to a hertz. And in this case, the answer is choice letter C. Number 16 says, place the following types of electromagnetic radiation in order of increasing uh, frequency. So one thing to remember is that low energy, low frequency, and long, because it's a distance, wavelength are all at one end. And this is because of the equation C equals lambda nu and E equals HC over lambda and E equals H nu. We know the proportionality between these things because in all of those equations, these variables are related by constants. So anytime it's low energy, it's also low frequency, it's also long wavelength because they're all related by constants. On the other side, we have high energy, high frequency, and short wavelength. So the reason that it's important to know these things is because it, you could be asked this question to rank them in terms of increasing frequency, increasing energy, increasing wavelength. Um, all cases are possible. It's also when you're doing um, absorptions and emissions, um, you have to think about it in terms of energy. So when it comes to the electromagnetic radi uh, radiation, we have radio waves, which is our lowest energy type. Then we have microwaves, which is next then infrared or IR, then visible, which is important because we can see it. And this is a very small part of the spectrum, but we also have our Roy G Biv. It's also important to remember that this uh, is also in order. So this is red to violet, something I learned when I was a little kid. So red, orange, uh, yellow, green, so on and so forth. And this is in order from low energy to high energy. Next, we have UV, followed by X-ray, and finally, gamma. So in this case, we want them in terms of increasing frequency. So what I suggest you do is you think about increasing in terms of biggest first or smallest first. So here you want smallest first. So in this case, it's choice letter E, microwaves, visible light, X-ray. That's got smallest first.
So this is how um, you basically need to know the electromagnetic spectrum, and you need to know it in terms of all three variables, and then you can answer any of these questions. Number 17 is another example of a, uh, a somewhat advanced question, but if you know how to do it, um, it will help you. So it's one of those things. If you know how to do a harder one, it makes the easier ones easier. So it says, how many photons are contained in a burst of yellow light, 589 nanometers, from a sodium lamp that contains 609 kilojoules of energy? So we can use the wavelength to find the energy because we know the equation that relates the two. E equals HC over lambda. But what is this the energy of? This is the energy of a single photon. It is not the energy of a lot of photons. As I talked about in a previous problem, um, the sun delivers the vast, vast majority of energy to the Earth. How could it do that if photons have almost no energy? Lots and lots and lots of photons. So 609 kilojoules is an appreciable amount of energy. How many photons does it take? That's what we're trying to figure out here. Okay. So when we use E equals HC over lambda, as I've gone over in several previous problems, H is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds, that's Planck's constant, times the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And we have to plug in that wavelength in meters. So divide by 1 times 10 to the 9, where we get 5.89 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. When we do that, we find E equals 3.37 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. But what is this the energy of? This is the energy of one photon. Our overall energy is in kilojoules. So I'm going to convert this to kilojoules by dividing by 1,000, or 3.37 times 10 to the minus 22 kilojoules. I simply just divided that by 1,000. This equals the energy of a single photon. We can now use this equality for dimensional analysis. Starting with 609 kilojoules times, we want to put kilojoules on the bottom, 3.37 times 10 to the minus 22 kilojoules, and the one photon on the top. And what we find is we have 1.81 times 10 to the 24 photons. So even in 609 kilojoules of energy, which is by no means a large amount of energy, maybe the energy of a uh, relatively small candy bar, okay, this is more than a mole of photons. It's about three moles of photons. So it's, that's how substantial amount of energy can be transferred uh, from one place to another using light. Lots and lots and lots and lots of photons. To answer the question, the answer is choice letter C. So question 18 and 19 are almost the same, so I'm going to answer them here uh, together as a group. It says, which of the following transitions in a hydrogen atom represent emission of the longest wavelength photon? So a couple things we need to do. We need to translate long wavelength into energy. Long wavelength means low energy. E equals hc over lambda. So as um, wavelength goes up, energy goes down because they're on the opposite sides, right? Um, energy is on the top, lambda is on the bottom, so they're inversely proportional. So this is a low energy photon. We also need to notice the word emission, which they made easy for us because they bold and underlined it, underlined it for us. So if we think about energy in an atom, we have energy levels. N equals 1, N equals 2, N equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5, so on and so on to infinity. A couple of things to remember. One is that for an emission to occur, you have to start at a higher energy level and fall down to a lower energy level. Then a photon will be emitted because why? The atom, which is the system in this case, loses energy when an electron falls to a lower energy level. Well, where does that energy go, right? Law of conservation of energy, it has to go somewhere. So it goes out as a photon. So an emission is going from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. But all of these are possible. You can go from 4 to 3, you can go from 4 to 2, you can go from 4 to 1, you can go from 3 to 2, from 3 to 1. All cases are possible. 
So omission means falling. That's important because if we look through here, this is an omission. Four to two, that's down. Five to four is an omission. Three to four, this isn't an omission. This is an absorption. Three to one is an omission and one to two is an absorption. So it can't possibly be the answer. So just by looking for emissions, we've eliminated two of the five answers. Now, we want it to be low energy. The second thing to remember is that the energy levels get progressively closer together. So as you get further and further away from the nucleus, the energy gaps are smaller and smaller. So the smaller the gap, the less energy that will be released. So if we look here, we have four to two, which is basically here to here. So four to two, here to here. And this is energy scale. I should have labeled it. This is energy. Five to four is this little tiny gap, very little energy. And three to one is this larger gap. So five to four is the smallest energy gap because the energy levels get progressively closer and closer together. It's also only one transition. Now, you will not be asked questions like 4 to 2 versus 2 to 1, because probably 4 to 2 is smaller. However, you're not going to be asked that. Okay, so you're going to get a clear trend. Let's take another example in question 19. Which of the following transition in a hydrogen atom represent absorption of the smallest frequency photon? We again need to translate small frequency... Frequency and energy are directly proportional, so this also means low or small energy. So again, we're looking for a low energy. But this time, we're looking for an absorption. Absorption is the opposite. The atom gains energy. Well, how does it gain energy? The electron in the energy level absorbs a photon and jumps to a higher energy level. So we need it to go up. 5 to 6, that's good, that's going up. 1 to 3, that's good, that's going up. 4 to 1. That's going down, 4 to 1. This is not an absorption. That's an emission. 5 to 4, same thing. That's actually the answer to the previous question. 5 to 4 is an emission. 1 to 2 is an absorption. Now, how do we decide which one is the lowest energy? Well, in this case, we have 1 going to 2. This is the energy. Remember, this is the energy axis. So this is a fairly large amount of energy versus 5 to 6, I guess I have to draw 6 in there, um, even closer, it gets hard because I didn't space it well, um, but this is 5 to 6, this is a much smaller amount of energy. So even though this is going up one energy level, and this is going up one energy level, going up one energy level from 5 to 6 is much smaller in energy than going up one energy level from 1 to 2. So I hope that makes it clear on how we look at absorptions and emissions um, in this uh, context. Question 20 says, each of the following sets of quantum numbers is supposed to specify an orbital. Which of the following sets of quantum numbers contains an error? So I'm going to go over this question um, relatively briefly, but I am going to attempt uh, using YouTube to put a link to a video up here where at about seven and a half minutes into that video, you can get a much longer explanation of how this works. Um, with the limited time here on the exam, um, I do, or on the problem set, I basically just want to give you the nitty gritty details. But if you want a more complete explanation, hopefully you'll be able to find the link up here. I apologize in advance. If there is no link up here, that means that my technical skills are not very good. All right, because I don't know how to do it. So anyway, we'll see what happens with that. But let's go over this question. So the nitty gritty the details of this, again, are gone into in much more detail, so it'll make more sense. But as a quick and uh, dirty explanation for those of you who are just looking for um, the answer here because you already have a fundamental understanding of what's going on, n has possible values of 0 to infinity, and it hits integers. So it could be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to infinity. L equals 0 to n minus 1, and that's integers. So if n is 3, L could be 0, 1, or 2. 0 through n minus 1, all of the integers. M sub L is negative L through 0 to plus L. And that's, again, integers. 
and it's not given here that the fourth quantum number, m sub s, the spin quantum number, is plus one half or minus one half. So this is the oops, this is the quick reference sheet uh, for quantum numbers. Again, if I strongly recommend if you don't know what these are, that you take a look at the other video. So um, this is going to give us the um, quantum numbers. So if we look here, we're looking to see if they fit these rules. And I instantly notice in number E, letter E, N equals 3, L equals 3. Well, it can't be possible. So this is the correct answer. Why? Because if n equals 3, the only possible values of l are 0 to n minus 1. Said another way, 0, 1, and 2. l cannot be 3 when n equals 3. Said another way, there's no f orbital in n equals 3. Question 21 says, how many orbitals are in the third principal energy level? So for question 21 through the end, question 25, um, for uh, these cases, there are a lot of things to go over. And I'm going to go through question 21 through 25 relatively quickly here. But if you want to, hopefully there will be a description or another video, a link to another video up here, unless I have technical difficulties and I can't do that. Um, and then I'll probably just link them in the uh, description below um, so that you can find them. But this video will go over the more, much more detail quantum numbers and electron configurations, which will help you to answer uh, questions 21 through questions 25. All right, so it says, how many orbitals are contained in the third principal uh, quantum level, n equals 3, of a given atom? Well, if n equals 3, you can have a 3s, a 3p, or a 3d. There's 1s orbital, there's 3p orbitals, and there are 5d orbitals. If you count them, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So there are 9 total orbitals, which can hold 18 electrons in n equals 3. My trick is you could just square this, but if you're not sure what all of this stuff is, I strongly recommend um, you uh, watch the video at the beginning uh, that's linked up at the beginning of this question uh, because uh, I go through in great detail how what all this stuff means and I don't want to do that on the practice exam. In this section, I'm going to go through the remaining questions on this uh, practice set 22 through 25. Um, it's very important if you're not sure how to do the stuff that I'm going over here, uh, that you go back to question 21. And at the beginning of question 21, hopefully there will be a link uh, to a video that will go over in much greater detail. It's like a lecture. Um, what electron configurations are, quantum numbers, stuff like this. So it's very important that you view that video um, if you're not sure how to do this, because I'm going over these examples, but if you watch that video and you take notes and, and treat it like a lecture, you'll be able to do any example. All right, these are just random ex examples picked at random, but it's important that you're going to want to do um, any of these examples. If for whatever reason that video isn't linked, it will be in linked in the description down below this video, um, and it'll say something like electron configuration lecture, and that'll be the that'll be there. All right, so it says give the ground state electron configuration for iodine. Well, the first thing you want to do is find iodine on the periodic table. It's right there. So that's iodine. Now you want to write the noble gas in brackets from, from uh, one uh, period before it. So iodine's in period five, so we go to period four, we write the noble gas, krypton. That's the electron configuration of everything up until krypton. Said another way, that's the first 36 electrons. Then we start over here, 5s2, this is the s block, uh, 4d, because the d is one lower, 10, 4d10. And then finally, this is the P block, and this is 5, 5P, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 
Again, that is not enough time to go over this. This is just if you need a refresher. If you're not sure how I got this, I strongly recommend you watch the other video. It's a 40 minute lecture or something like this. It's not something I can go over in two minutes on this uh, problem set. So please watch the other lecture. And anyway, this is choice letter D. Number 22 says, Sorry, I'm trying to fit everything on the screen here. We don't need the lanthanides and the actinides. Write out the um, orbital diagram for the ground state of phosphorus. How many unpaired electrons are there? So this is iodine. Now we want to do phosphorus. So phosphorus is here. So we again, noble gas, neon, in the period before it, 3s2, 3p123. So the unpaired electrons are only going to be in the last orbital that you wrote. In order for an orbital to be full and you were to move on to the next orbital, the, um, they have to all be paired. Full is paired. So the only possible uh, place where you could have unpaired electrons is here. Well, if you have the 3p orbital and you have one, two, three orbitals and you have three electrons, you put them in up, 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 and you have three unpaired electrons. Let's try another example. Write out the orbital diagram for the ground state of fluorine. How many unpaired electrons are there? Well, we got to find fluorine here. So we go to the period before. We put helium. Then in this case, we have 2s2 and 2p12345. 2p5. So that is the electron configuration of fluorine. Again, the only one that could have um, unpaired electrons is the outermost one. So if we use the 2p, and we have 1, 2, 3. So we have to put five electrons in there. Up, up, up. That's three. Down, down. Four, five. How many unpaired electrons do we have? We have just one unpaired electron. Again, please watch the video um, linked at the beginning um, in order to... Uh, find the more details about how to do this. Finally, it says which orbital is an electron in if it has the following quantum numbers? n equals 3, l equals 1. This tells you the orbital. So it's a 3 orbital. That's what n is. So this is a 2p, n is 2. For l, we have to translate. If l equals 0, that's called an s, 1 is called a p, 2 is called a d, and 3 is called an f. So this is a 3, 1, P orbital, which is choice letter D. And again, for the final time, I go over this in much greater detail in the video than there is time for um, in this uh, practice set. So I hope you found this helpful. Um, and again, please do watch the other notes or the other lecture videos um, if you are not sure about electron configurations or how many unpaired electrons there are or how to convert from quantum numbers to orbitals and stuff like this. That's all covered there.